Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm hoping everyone has uh, audio and can hear me. I'm uh, Hedy Arbabi. I'm a lecturer at the uh, uh, University of Sheffield on built environment. I'll be chairing this session today on uh, innovation and infrastructure sustainability methods, metrics, and measures. Uh, we've got an hour and a half and three speakers today. I'm going to do a very quick five minutes uh, housekeeping, uh, and we have 10 minutes of uh, networking at the very end. Um, we're going to have uh, the three talks uh, back to back, uh, 20 minute slots. Uh, if you could please uh, direct your questions into the chat uh, aimed at the speaker you want, I will be filtering these out and we'll have uh, 15 minutes at the end where we'll go through the questions and uh, any potential follow-ups that there may be. Uh, a point of uh, order is that the, uh, the session is being recorded. So uh, just be aware uh, you are being recorded. If you do not want to be, you can uh, check out of the session. Uh, otherwise, it is being recorded. We don't have any comfort breaks uh, planned for this session. Uh, I'm hoping that's okay with everyone, given that we having we are having a session that's less than two hours uh, long. I believe that's the main stuff we need to get through. As for the talks and our speakers, I will be um, timing you two to 20 minutes, I will turn my video on when you have three minutes uh, left and will instruct you to let you know that you have a minute left at the end. We're gonna be slightly strict with the timing, so I will not let you run over 20 minutes so that we have enough time to address the questions at the end. Uh, with that, our first speaker is uh, Christopher Lowens from the Queen's University Belfast. Um, with uh, their work on what is the state of the art in energy and transport poverty metrics. Um, with that, Chris, it's to you. Great, thanks very much. Um, just let me share my screen. Can everyone see that? Um, I'm gonna take that. That, that. That's, that's a no. I don't think it's shared. How's that? That's that's better. Great. Um, sorry, I've lost my presentation mode. Here we go. Okay. So um, my name's Chris, and I'm a second year PhD student at Queen's University Belfast. And this presentation is titled, What's the State of the Art in Energy and Transport Poverty Metrics? Um, my primary supervisor is Dr. Aoife Foley, who's also at Queen's University of Belfast. And I'm co-supervised by Professor David Rooney, also of Queen's, and um, Professor Benjamin Sovacool, who's from Sussex. So to begin with, uh, this presentation is going to summarize a review article that we recently published in Energy Economics, um, where we have conducted a bibliometric analysis on energy and transport poverty metrics. So for context, um, recently in, social in the social sciences, it's been postulated that energy and transport poverty are not distinct, um, but rather they have overlapping causes and links. And the combination of research from both engineering and social science disciplines suggests to us that um, energy and transport poverty can manifest a double vulnerability for particular households uh, in that they may be able to afford neither uh, energy or transport or be forced to make tough choices about which of those items to prioritize. And furthermore, as the energy and transport systems become further interconnected as the low carbon transition progresses, um, a question that follows from that first hypothesis is how are these conditions measured? and from which viewpoints do we consider them? So to begin to answer that question, we conducted a bibliometric analysis on metadata gleaned from a web of science search um, to try and uncover some previously unexamined trends and links and correlations in the literature. 
Um, just before getting into the findings to define the issues, um, energy poverty we've defined as the inability to secure materially and socially necessitated energy services, such as heating a home or using appliances within the home. Meanwhile, transport poverty is the enforced lack of mobility services, which are necessary for participation in society. And that results from the inaccessibility, the unaffordability or the unavailability of transport. Um, and so there are overlapping causal mechanisms, mechanisms and overlapping factors which affect these issues. And those include, but aren't limited to, low income, um, housing location, debt, mental and physical health, and educational attainment and high fuel costs. And why should we care about these problems? Um, well, energy and transport poverty have very serious adverse effects on the health and financial well-being of people. And they also have adverse effects on the wider economy. And so when we discuss these issues, we're not concerned with the conditions themselves per se, um, but rather we are concerned with the adverse physical and social consequences, or rather the inequity that results from people living in these conditions. And going forward, we're concerned that decarbonisation may present a new set of injustices, such as um, people who can't afford to decarbonise their homes may remain energy poor, or people who can't afford to not own a car can't afford to upgrade to an EV because of the capital cost, nor can they afford rising liquid fuel costs. And so, um, yeah, we conducted a bibliometric analysis and bibliometric analysis is a statistical evaluation of the metadata of articles and it seeks to determine the influence of those publications on the literature body and the wider world. And in the earliest phase of data collection, we tried to be as wide as possible with the search fields of energy and transport poverty, um, whilst deliberately excluding extraneous literature. So to that end, a list of search terms were developed and we ran a search in Web of Science and then the metadata were analyzed. And some of the results of that metadata analysis are shown on screen. So you, firstly, on the graph, you can see some topic clustering, which occurs around uh, topics such as fuel poverty and energy efficiency. And then we also see clusters around researchers and those researchers cluster around topics such as energy poverty in the developed world. And one thing you'll notice um, from the graph is that intercluster work is rare. Um, for example, uh, until the recently, uh, up until recently, fuel and energy poverty, fuel poverty and energy poverty were distinct um, in that energy poverty mostly concerned the developing world and fuel poverty concerned the developed world. And now we're seeing those areas slowly come together. Um, so for example, so that gap can be partly explained by the separate geographies of study um, and also by the separate definitions that up until recently, those groups have been, have chosen to study. And so uh, really what we can say here is there's work yet to be done to unite these groups in these research fields. Um, as with fuel and energy poverty, um, in transport poverty, both topic clusters and researcher clusters have formed. First of all, uh, it's worth noting that the, the body of transport poverty literature is much smaller than that of fuel and energy poverty um, by an order of magnitude or so. Um, the literature is much more nebulous than the energy poverty body and it's scattered across a large number of search terms. Um, and also we see like a self-fulfilling self cycle appears to uh, form in this body of literature in that the research itself is interdisciplinary in the sense that it combines many disciplines into one small area. But what doesn't happen is that these small areas then don't cross the boundaries out of their own silos uh, to work with each other. Um, so summarized on screen now are a few uh, metrics that we thought were pretty significant or appeared frequently or captured a unique aspect of energy or transport poverty. So to begin with, consensual or self-reported energy poverty is significant because the lived experience of people in energy poverty may be highly different to um, a strict financial measurement. Um, the next two, twice the median and half the median are official measures used at the European Union level. 
and those determine households with either very high energy expenditure or households which may depress their energy expenditure in response to financial constraints. Um, mobility and accessibility poverty. Uh, this is a composite measure which determines the number of options available to households for transport and how difficult they might find accessing services. Um, 10%, so that this metric initially evolved in the fuel poverty debate, and it's where a household spends more than 10% of its disposable income on uh, home heating or electricity. And that's been, uh, the analogy has been taken across into transport poverty where it's started to be applied there. And then lastly, um, forced car ownership is where a household's forced to own at least one car and then consequently reports difficulties in affording at least one of five household items. And what this does is kind of tells you where owning cars adversely affects a household financially, even if they're forced to own that car. So the knowledge gaps in the debate over the measurement of energy poverty and the critiques we can level at the debate. Firstly, um, the definition of the problem very much changes the scale. Secondly, um, energy poverty is very often measured just with one metric. And a combination of metrics is definitely better than using any single one, which can typically only capture one aspect of the problem. We think that extra factors should accompany fuel poverty metrics, and those could be things like health indicators or household debt measures. Summertime cooling has been overlooked, especially in the UK, and that's going to become an increasingly problematic issue in a future of warmer summers. Data on these problems is very limited. Standards for household appliance usage have not been defined, whereas we have definite standards for home heating. And yet the debate are yet the measurements for fuel poverty or energy poverty now refer to all household energy use. Often um, poverty lines are arbitrary. And then lastly, it's very rare for the actual amount of energy used by a household to be equal to the required energy that's used. And um, turning to transport, there's no standardized definition of transport poverty and consequently fewer critiques and each subcomponent definition of transport poverty tends to be studied individually. Consequently, there's no standard comparison across jurisdictions from country to from one country to the next. It's extremely difficult to define standards in transport and therefore to measure it because we travel in order to meet needs that we have, such as access to services. Um, applying expenditure metrics to transport poverty results in the same problem of arbitrary thresholds as we have with energy. There's a chicken and egg problem, um, again, with data and metrics in that better data would lead to better metrics, but to collect good data, you need to know what you're looking for. And then lastly, the equity has mostly been considered implicitly rather than explicitly. And what are the consequences of these gaps and these critiques? Um, as stated, a combination of metrics is better than a single metric in both the regions of energy and transport poverty. Uh, extra factors should accompany uh, energy poverty and transport poverty metrics. Uh, other items we'd like to include here would be air pollution data. Again, the data limitation applies to both sets of metrics. Assessing vulnerability is to each condition is less fraught than technical difficulties than attempting a quantitative measure. And therefore a layering of assessment of vulnerability and metrics could point a new way forward. And lastly, again, the defining of standards in travel is extremely difficult, but if we want to actually unify the measurement of energy and transport poverty, we may have to do this. And so moving forward, we recommend that the term fuel poverty should be replaced with the term energy poverty. Um, firstly, this is more appropriate in a decarbonized future and it will unify areas of the literature. Um, we think that composite metrics should be explored further in different countries and different contexts and bring in the 
lenses that we mentioned such that these issues become studied as a complex problem. Further examination of the overlapping services from energy and transport is needed for equitable outcomes in the future energy and transport system. And additional considerations such as an examination of the services should be layered on top of the existing vulnerability lenses and metrics. And again, for immediate policy purposes, we recommend the shift away from relying on single indicators. And so we're in the School of Engineering and what do we think that we should contribute to this field? Well, firstly, um, we think a better job could be done of studying equity explicitly. Um, secondly, when we are planning or designing systems, um, we really have to think about what we're designing these for. And so to put that differently, we're applying new constraints to the decarbonization optimization problem. Uh, we think we should also be making the best use of technology. Um, we should be pricing externalities appropriately, and we should be considering things like planning changes in order to maximize housing density, which will benefit um, allow for the ex exploration of community energy schemes and also minimize travel distances. And um, lastly, there's also a lot of lip service to interdisciplinarity across these areas, but any serious implementation of uh, these findings has yet to be um, enacted. And so just to conclude, I'm gonna to touch briefly on the next steps of uh, my PhD work. So I'm gonna begin with a household survey across the island of Ireland um, to measure the actual extent of energy and transport poverty uh, rather than just the hypothesized extent of this problem. Um, we wanna know about the demographics of people who suffer from these conditions, uh, examine their coping behaviors and determine what are the dominant drivers of this problem, these problems. And then after that, we want to see if the views of the literature and views of experts in these fields actually align with the collected data and then secondly, there's a growing body of research that points the way towards um, a need for comparative case studies uh, of community scale solutions to decarbonisation as a means of facilitating just transitions. And we've identified some case study locations and we intend to conduct some simulation and optimization modelling in order to examine equity outcomes of decarbonisation options at the community scale. And with this modelling, we think we have the capacity to examine the best use of technologies, how we might price externalities and how we might design systems. And lastly, we're going to measure the costs and benefits and the trade-offs of such systems and compare those to some measurements of equity. Um, thank you, that's, uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, for both an exciting talk and also keeping to the time. I appreciate it. Um, uh, for everyone else, um, if you have any questions for Chris and his talk, please uh, direct them at the chat and um, uh, direct them at Chris. We'll get to the questions at the very end. For our um, second talk, uh, Kadim Lokesh from Institute for Transport Studies, University of Leeds, is going to uh, tell us about embodied carbon and tra transport infrastructure and uh, with a particular emphasis on uh, road transport and road construction. Um, to you, Kadim. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. And I hope my presentation is currently being shared as well. Uh, no, we don't have the, I don't think we can see the presentation. Okay, um, there we go. Uh, we have a view of your overall PowerPoint, PowerPoint window at the moment. Um, Getting there. Yeah, there we go. That's, that's all set up now. Great. Right, firstly, um, Thank you so much for the opportunity to decarbonate and the panel uh, for the introduction. I'm Karim Lokesh, uh, I'm a research fellow at the Institute for Transport Studies and uh, this work was produced with uh, Daniel Dinsley Tingley from uh, University of Sheffield. I'm here to shed some light on the critical nature of uh, transport's embodied carbon and why it is a massive concern that has been marginalized 
uh, we'll be using uh, the road infrastructure as an example to show why reaching real zero here is key to reaching net zero in 2050. So I'll be following a pattern where I'll be presenting the analysis uh, followed by the outcomes right away. So we don't go back and forth or you know, uh, cause confusion. So we are all on the same page. So we start with setting the background, um, providing uh, the technical details of the analysis and the assumptions. And then I'll dive straight into the first output and followed by the sensitivity studies to um, evaluate those outputs a bit further. And then we go on a bit further by uh, expanding our imagination a bit more before we reach conclusion. So what exactly is embodied carbon and why is it a concern? Uh, embodied carbon are basically emissions associated with the production and the use of materials that lead on to building a much larger asset. Uh, this with the operational emissions together make up infrastructure carbon. So UK's infrastructure carbon at the moment accounts for about 490 million tons. So that's 53% of UK's consumption-based carbon footprint. Of the 53, 22% comes from the transport sector, and it is the only sector among the various other sectors you see in this pie chart to continuously increase its emission levels since the 1990 baseline. So this is not a concern that is sort of exclusive to the UK. There are a number of nations across the world that have set legally binding targets to reach, to, uh, to become carbon neutral by 2050. And they all promise a massive expansion on electrification and hydrogen rollout to address their domestic and international carbon targets when it comes to the transport sector. But the one thing that we all must bear in mind is any infrastructure rollout will have carbon consequences and overlooking this assets in life cycle impact will lead to perverse results when we get to 2050. So uh, coming back to the UK, uh, when we look at the commitments related to this within the transport decarbonization plan, there is a heavy reliance and in some case also externalizing their responsibilities onto the construction sector for innovation and carbon management strategies. This leaves some key questions unanswered. Basically, so what are the transport stakeholders going to do about their infrastructure carbon? There are appraisal procedures, you know, available, speaking as a devil's advocate, there are appraisal procedures available to evaluate the economic and the environmental uh, benefits and costs of some of the schemes that you see here in the slide, like junction improvements, smart motorways, but these procedures are mainly reporting tools and they do not lead to any kind of long-term monitoring or regulate, regulation of these carbon impacts from these assets. This is a massive policy gap and bridging it requires a repository of evidence that becomes a basis for low carbon innovation or even create a template for any future schemes to be designed and assessed from a net zero consistent fashion. And this is precisely the kind of evidence that we lack at a national and at a local level. So we in the study uh, contribute to this evidence, this repository in a small way, by starting with estimating the high level carbon threshold for roads of varying construction scales, like you see the dual two lane, dual three lane, and a single two lane carriageway. Uh, we also estimate the carbon for each of the components within this infrastructure. So we employed the principles of life cycle assessment uh, to understand the full life carbon impact of the asset, over their service life, let's say about 40 years. So the reason we went for roads of these specific dimensions is that these types of roads make the most of urban and rural A roads here in the UK. And more importantly, they cater to a dominant transport demand share of about 115 billion vehicle miles in just 2020. We also did a few sensitivity studies to um, assess the impacts of alternative materials and the road infrastructure's interaction with a steadily decarbonizing energy sector to see if there are any perks or carbon savings to depreciate the asset's whole life carbon over its service life. So we start first by setting the functional unit, which for the study will be a kilometer of new road. There are various levels of dimensions that you need to follow uh, for asphalt pavement, like the schematic that you see here. Um, and it varies with the terrain specifications. But for our study, we went for standard dimensions uh, suggested by Highways England in their design guide. Next, we define the system boundary for our study. So here we present the different subsystems under the road system to which we estimate embodied and operational carbon. It starts with producing the materials towards construction 
through to operation and maintenance of this road um, over the 40 year period. So regarding what elements are required for embodied carbon estimation, we really need bill of materials and the energy expenditures that go into each of these subsystems. Uh, but when it comes to uh, road operation, we are only looking at the energy supply for road lighting because road traffic doesn't fall within the um, infrastructure carbon horizon. And then finally, we have uh, road decommissioning where this involves road closures in, involving chipping away of road surface and salvaging the material for later application. However, because of the rarity of this phenomenon, uh, we chose to exclude it from the scope of our analysis. So besides acquiring some key primary data from um, Highways England and uh, Transport for the North, to which we are thankful, uh, there are other publicly available guidances that we had to refer to to refine our methodology and assumptions. So the carbon emissions are basically calculated by combining the material and energy quantities with their respective uh, emission uh, factors from the relevant inventories that are available as well. And they are summed up and normalized to our functional unit, which is to one kilometer of the new road that we are building in this model. So uh, we also use the Highway England's carbon tool to uh, validate the threshold that we had estimated by this method. So diving straight into our first results is, so here we present uh, the embodied em emissions and operational carbon for one kilometer of a new road uh, of varying construction scales. So in summary, the construction and use of this one kilometer emits anywhere between 800 to 2,700 tons of carbon uh, varying with the construction scale. So if we were to scale these whole life emissions to that of a tailpipe emission from an average car, the life cycle carbon for um, dual three lane, dual two and single two lane emissions would amount to 16, 14 and 6 million car emissions per kilometer. So of all the subsystems, it is quite evident that the material production for the roads construction produces 70% of the whole life carbon, closely followed by that which comes from generating energy for road lighting purposes. So now we know the dominant carbon contributor here are the materials. So what happens if we switch traditional materials for low carbon alternatives or secondary materials? So this was our first sensitivity study. So here we looked at a variety of scenarios, starting from bio-based alternative uh, asphalt to um, the reuse of secondary resources. But the commercial nature of these various scenarios are unknown at this point. The reason that we chose these scenarios, however, is because they were either being piloted in uh, some road net, in the existing road network or have been planned for trial in the future within the industry. And only specific blends of these variants were adopted to ensure that the long term mechanical performance and the structural integrity of, of the stretch of road that we're looking at is not compromised. So in scenario one, we have the bio-based binders acting as alternatives to asphalt binder. Scenario two and three looks at crushed concrete and construction rejects acting as 100% replacement for natural aggregates. This is crucial because these aggregates tend to make 30% by weight of our functional unit of study. And then we also have a scenario for more energy efficient warm mix asphalt as an alternative to hot mix. And then finally, we are looking at recycled asphalt pavement, which is another form of a secondary resource acting as a replacement for fine aggregates on, on the road surface for application on the road surface. So among the different resource efficiency scenarios that we have looked at, uh, the best plausible and most carbon saving scenario was scenario two, which involves the use of crushed concrete and construction rejects uh, within the sub grade or sub base layer. Still, the scenario delivered a humble 14% carbon reduction for just material production. And when applying that over the entire assets life cycle, the, the savings diluted down to 12% relative to the baseline figures. Uh, with warm mix asphalt, the remnant moisture um, that is present in this warm mix asphalt tends to cause moisture damage over time. So this requires more frequent maintenance procedures uh, compared to the baseline. So this sometimes tend to, you know, either neutralize or in some case even outweigh any carbon benefits that you could get from its use. And finally, we have the RAP, which is again gaining a lot of uh, commercial recognition because of the material circularity characteristic. However, the long term quality of the build is again affected because of the age of, of these recycled aggregates that we are using. But in summary, the innovations that we have looked at 
tends to deliver just 10 to 14 percent reduction um, over the pavement's life cycle. Um, however, it has the potential to improve these savings by up to 20 to 25 percent if we were to increase the blend quantities or the quality of, of these materials that we are integrating. For the second round of sensitivity analysis, we wanted to see how the energy supply to road lighting behaves to a steadily decarbonizing energy grid. So this is where we used the future energy scenario that was published by a national grid last year. So FES or future energy scenario represents a number of different plausible pathways by which the UK's energy system could reach net zero in 2050. There are four different pathways of which we adopted two with varying levels of innovation uptake and societal behavior. Firstly, we have the steady progression pathway, which represents a situation where the tech uptake and the societal behavior are happening at the same rate, similar to today. Uh, and then we have the system transformation pathway, where we assume rapid transformation happening on the supply side, with them performing at the peak of their efficiency. However, the societal behavior is more or less in line with the baseline levels. The table below actually shows the level of low carbon um, energy sources that are being integrated into the grid uh, in 2050 compared to our 2020 levels. The main difference between the two scenarios is, you know, when we come off or retain our fossil resource usage. In the first uh, steady progression one, we don't necessarily come off our fossil resources. In the system transformation pathway, however, we mean our fossil resources by 2038. There is also a steady integration of carbon capture and storage technology, as vague as it may be at this moment, um, but we are including it into our analysis because it has been suggested as a plausible way to reach net zero. So taking you directly into the first output, we observe significant reductions in operational carbon reductions by about 60 to 80 percent under the steady progression scenario. This is boosted to about 70 to 200 percent over the service life of the road itself. But this exponential increase, again, comes from uh, the CCS technologies, which may, we may not necessarily have any access to because they are mainly prioritized for hard to decarbonize sectors like aviation or shipping. But they still have been presented here um, to sort of entertain a hypothetical scenario, answering a what if question, really. So we saw how operational emissions behave to a decarbonizing grid. How about we apply them over the road's uh, whole life? So here we are looking at road lighting decarbonization applied to both baseline and the best plausible um, resource efficiency construction scenario as well. So the 60% and above carbon saving that we saw in the earlier slide is now diluted down to a maximum of 18% under the steady progression pathway and it is only slightly boosted to about 40% under the system transformation pathway. So this still leaves a gap of about 60 to 80% in reaching carbon neutrality for a time beyond net zero, because these are reported for 2060. So this is uh, where we uh, sort of expand our imagination a bit further. So on left, we have the maximum carbon savings from the earlier slide for the two scenarios. But please note that this is only for when the energy is affected by grid decarbonization for road lighting only. Now, on the right, we wanted to stretch our uh, hypothesis a bit further, where we assume that the decarbonizing grid caters to the factories that provide us the construction material or if they were all locally sourced. So the maximum whole life carbon that you could get from a decarbonizing grid under the steady progression pathway is about 30 to 60 percent. And under the system transformation pathway, it, it extends to about 90%. The bottom line is that the, even with this level of decarbonization and right past our 2050, we are still unable to reach net zero at an infrastructure level. There is still a 10 to 30% gap in achieving carbon neutrality, even with the most optimistic scenario. So this is exactly what makes infrastructure carbon a much more bigger concern than other tailpipe emissions that we are concerned with at the moment. So here are some key discussion points and stats that I would like for us to take away. Um, embodied carbon or material bound emissions make up nearly 70% of the whole life carbon impacts of the road. So unless there are active carbon abatement strategies employed by the transport sector, 
for example, uh, solar pavements or piezoelectric pavements, these emissions will remain over the service life of the asset or sometimes even made worse by induced traffic. Next, if we were to put a scale on emissions and relate them to you know, the tailpipe emissions, similar to an exercise that we did earlier, we are adding emissions from 4 million cars with every kilometer of lane extension. And lane extension happens to make a majority of the, uh, majority of the schemes in the RIS2 pipeline. In terms of tech uptake, innovation in material circularity, uh, design and engineering is currently a rapidly budding area. So some notable trials like the use of 50% RAP on a stretch of M25 within the Transport for London's network and the trial for 100% recyclable, uh, sorry, 100% circular asphalt pavement in, uh, by the European Asphalt Pavement Association are, it basically gives us hope for mitigating material emissions, but more has to happen in this area. Uh, one other aspect that needs focus here, that needs the most focus here, is how the infrastructure is being provided and used by the end users. Because at the end of the day, infrastructure influences travel behavior. So recently, the Welsh government decided to freeze their future road development schemes so they can be appraised more thoroughly in the current context of global pandemic. They did this in their reach to reach their intermittent, in, sorry, in their race to reach their intermittent target by 2030. We need similar kinds of measures here for risk or the airport expansion or the various other concerns that Kevin raised during our plenary session. I mean, we need a net zero consistent revival of all forms of transport appraisal procedures, some clear carbon budgets for the various types of schemes that are within these pipelines, and more importantly, a standardized carbon guidance in planning and appraisal to mitigate infrastructure emissions. And these must also be strengthened to become a part of the national planning policy framework too. So hopefully the study has presented a kind of a big picture providing a, level, a high level insight into the key areas that we must focus on. I would love to hear from you um, as to how we can bridge this gap that I've suggested within uh, the infrastructure angle. Please feel free to get in touch if you have any further clarifications or if there's anything that could make this analysis a bit more robust. Um, thank you so much for your patience. Thank you, Kadam, for a uh, both sobering and a slightly terrifying uh, talk on our both uh, challenges in decarbonizing the road network and also how much of it we are, so how far away we are in actually achieving that. Um, as uh, Kada mentioned, uh, please feel free to address your questions in the chat box uh, to her. We're gonna circle back to all the questions at the end of the session. Our third speaker is uh, Yuzhou Tang from University of Leeds. I'm so honored to be with you to communicate academic questions and ideas. The title of my academic presentation is Life Cycle Assessment of household electricity system with EV charging demand. And PV generation in the UK. I will talk about the topic on the environmental and economic impact of storage system. First of all, I want to introduce myself. I'm Yu Zhou Tang. I come from Shandong University and the University of Leeds. The contents are listed as follows. All our researches are conducted by the academic source. Generally speaking, we are committed to environmental impact, especially the carbon emissions of storage system. Global warming, which caused by carbon emissions, has affected our life in many ways, like glacial fusion, loss of sea ice, intense heat waves, and sea level rise. According to the statistics, households accounted for roughly 38% of the UK's total electricity consumption and around 15% of GHG emissions. Transport accounted for 28% of GHG emissions and the EVs are gradually replacing IC EVs as one of the main household vehicles in the future. Therefore, Households' electricity system has considerable potential to support the realization of the net zero emissions ta target through strategies 
such as decentralized electricity production at domestic scales. PV battery systems and EV charging systems are considered to be two of the keys to the future environmental friendly household electricity system. However, there is little understanding of the environmental impact of the household PV battery system with EV charging. Great Britain's electricity grid has been relatively successful in decarbonizing over the last 10 years, with many coal power plant closing and expansion of non-dispatchable low carbon generation. The accurate evaluation of electricity carbon emissions greatly affects the accounting of household electricity emissions. Emissions factors are usually used to evaluate the impact of energy systems on carbon emissions and mainly include average emissions factors and marginal emissions factors. AEFS is the emissions contained in the electricity consumption. MEFS is the impact of the electricity system load on emissions. Many studies have shown that AEFS would erroneously calculate the, the emissions related to the intervention. Therefore, MEFS is used to calculate the carbon emissions impact of energy storage systems in this research. Life cycle assessment and life cycle cost have been widely applied to household PV battery systems and the EV charging system to evaluate the environmental and economic impacts. However, most research has conducted the carbon emissions of electricity demand and generation using average values of electricity generation mix and emissions factors. As you can see from the table 2, almost all researchers use AEFs to calculate carbon emissions of electricity system. Studies that assess carbon emissions based on the marginal emissions of generation mix has not previously been investigated in LCA approach. Therefore, the major challenges and contributions of the current research are summarized as follows. Firstly, the influence mechanism of PV battery system and smart charging system on environmental and economic performance are discussed through the comparison of LCA and LCC approach of different scenarios. Secondly, we determine the potential to further reduce emissions by shifting the load during the period the vehicle is plugged in. The Crest demand model was used for generating household electricity demand and the rooftop PV generation profile. For a preset to the simulation, household electricity demand data and PV generation data were collected at 5 minute resolution from January to December in 2019 for a semi detached house in the Leeds. The PV capacity of 2.6 kilowatt peak is chosen based on the roof area of average semi detached house. The charging demand was modeled based on the data set provided by OEREV, details over 3 million charging sessions for domestic users. The times of connection and disconnection, the powering duration, and the charging energy demand were available in the data set. Overnight charging and afternoon charging were the two most common behaviors in the data set. According to the reference, only the overnight charging has been considered. The charging behavior with a connection time of 18 o'clock, a disconnection time of 9 o'clock, and the energy demand of 7.2 kilowatt hour was started in this research. The rated charging power was assumed as 7 kilowatt. The household analyzed in this study was assumed to have only one BEV. The half hourly time series of MEFS for 2019 is calculated using monitoring data from the JB National Grid and carbon intensity factors. The carbon intensity factors is showing table 3. The linear regression algorithm was applied to calculate MEFS in this study, which expressed the relationship between the change of the hourly grid carbon emissions and the national net electricity demand. And then we model three scenarios in this research. First is initial charging, which means household just uses electricity from the grid and the EV uses passive charging. Second is passive charging, 
which means household has PV battery system and EV uses passive charging. Third is smart charging, which means household has PV battery system and EV uses smart charging. Figure 3 explains the difference between passive charging and smart charging for EV. As you can see from figure 3, the blue bar is passive charging. That means the PV is charged as soon as possible when plugged in. And the, the orange one is smart charging, which means it's charged at the lowest MEFS during the plugging duration. The electricity consumption of a typical household electric system in 2019 is selected at the functional unit for analysis of the energy input, material consumption, and the environmental impact of the entire system. As shown in Figure 4, the system boundary of cradle to grave, including extraction, manufacture, operation and maintenance, disposal and recycling of all components is selected. The panel size of 2.6 kilowatt peak is chosen according to the roof area of an average semi-detached house. The household battery size is assumed to be 4.8 kilowatt hour, equal to that of the Moxer smart battery. The charge and the inverter efficiencies are assumed at 98.5% and 97% respectively. The storage system operation in the household depends on the electricity tariff as showing table 6. The recipe midpoint model and the eco-invent database in Gavi software is used to conduct a life cycle impact assessment of different scenarios. The results are as follows. The comparison of figure 5 and figure 6 indicated that the household electricity load during the daytime was significantly reduced with the application of PV battery system. Around 8% to 58% of the daily household electricity demand was met by the PV battery system, which caused the reduction for environmental impact and the total cost of the use phase. The household load surged after 18 o'clock due to the electricity demand of EV charging. As you can see, there is a red bar in Figure 5. However, the PV electricity stored by the battery efficiently reduced the household load at that moment in passive charging, especially in summer. You can see it's almost an origin bar in Figure 6. The comparison of Figure 6 and Figure 7 demonstrated that the smart charging system further dispersed the household load during the plugging duration, which greatly reduced the peak load from 18 o'clock to 20 o'clock. The electricity used to charge EV was more likely to be the grid electricity at the moment of low MEFS rather than PV electricity. In addition, the electricity load during the period of high electricity bills significantly declined. 18 types of the midpoint environmental impact categories of the household electricity consumption system are characterized for the three charging scenarios. The scenarios with PV battery system can effectively reduce the environmental impact compared with the initial charging scenario. According to the normalization results, the distribution of the environmental impacts of scenarios is concentrated on the three impact categories of freshwater ecotoxicity, marine ecotoxicity, and the human carcinogenic toxicity. These three categories are recognized as the key impact categories of the household electricity consumption system. Compared with the original charging scenario, the impact of the three key impact categories on of the system of its PV battery system was reduced by around 22%, 21%, and 20% respectively. As shown in Figure 9, the electricity consumption was the key impact material for all of the scenarios, which accounted for 100% 
86% and 86% of the total environmental impact of the initial charging, passive charging, and smart charging, respectively. Table 8 shows that the scenarios with household PV battery system had considerable initial investment cost. With the, with the application of PV battery system, the total cost of, of operation phase was reduced and the smart charging scenario had the lowest total cost of operation phase, which was £484. Then we focus on carbon emissions of the system. In this section, the MAFS was used to calculate the carbon emissions of the electricity consumed from the grid. The carbon emissions of the facilities remained unchanged. The carbon emissions of electricity consumed for the three charging scenarios under the functional unit were calculated for each day of the year. Figure 10 showed the monthly carbon emissions of use phase for each scenario from January to December in 2019. The results indicated that an installation of PV battery system could effectively reduce carbon emissions caused by household electricity consumption. The benefits were highly related to the sound duration. Specifically, the proportion of carbon emissions reduction for scenarios with PV battery system could reach around 40% in summer. A summary of the life cycle carbon emissions with MEFS for each charging scenario was shown in Table 9. Around 730 kg carbon emissions could be reduced in the scenarios with PV battery system. The smart charging scenario could further decline carbon emissions by 45 kg on the basis of passive charging which was contrary to the results obtained by using the Ecoimmune database. It was interesting to find that the life cycle carbon emissions of household electricity system when using the MEFS were 40% lower than that when using the AEFS from the Ecoimmune database. The AEFS in the Ecoimmune database just refer to the grid situation in 2014. So it's important to use MEFS instead of AEFS to calculate the carbon emissions for household electricity system. In addition, the carbon emissions reduction by smart charging demonstrated that changing the charging time could effectively reduce the carbon emission caused by EV charging by 2.5% in this case. This study evaluated the environmental impact, especially the carbon emissions of the household electricity system in the UK. Results showed that the PV battery system met 8% to 58% of daily household electricity demand, which reduced the environmental impact by 20%, the carbon emissions by 25%, and the electric bills by 32% compared with the initial household electricity system. The smart charging system further dispersed the household electricity load during the EV plug in duration and achieved a 2.5% reduction in carbon emissions and 16% reduction in electricity bills based on the PV battery system. As for the policy implications, High initial investment cost was the main factor limiting the deployment of household PV battery systems. Household electricity system integrating PV battery system and smart charging system could bring significant environmental benefits. There are no financial incentives for households to adopt battery control systems that reduce emissions by responding to great marginal emissions factors. This study will provide a reference for the similar research in UK households. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yu Zhou. Uh, if we can.